Hey everybody, welcome back. At the time of this recording, it's just a few days before Easter 2020, and for the past few weeks, we have been looking at some of your most foundational, um, honest, greatest questions that you have about Christianity, about God, about the Bible, basically about the most important matters of the Christian faith. So this is the third and final and most important part of answering the fantastic question that one of you sent in uh, several weeks ago. You ask this, Is it okay to fear that there's nothing after this life? To be scared that you don't know if he is real or if heaven is real, having the fear of nothing after. So in parts one and two of the answer, we looked back at the book of Ecclesiastes, which asks the question, what if this life is all that there is? Now, in case you haven't watched those videos yet, make sure to check them out at some point. Uh, but if you haven't, here's like a 30 second recap. OK, so so one doubt in the biblical sense is a natural part of life. Sometimes we try to ignore it or pretend it away because we think that having questions is bad or evil or sinful. But if we bring our questions to God, if we have people in our lives whom we can turn to for help with these tough questions, our faith will always come out stronger on the other side. God is patient with our doubts and he often uses those questions that we have about him to lead us closer to him. Two, Yes, it is okay to doubt the existence of life after death, so long as that doubt leads you to search for the answer to your questions, rather than just being left paralyzed or maybe apathetic by the question itself. And three, take it from someone who's tried everything that this world has to offer. Even if life under the sun is all that there is, God's way is still the best way. God's way of living is the greatest way to live. So with all that being said, let's dive into today's answer. Make no mistake about it. I believe that Jesus was who he said he was. I also believe that the New Testament's account of what happened 2,000 years ago is true. I believe that Jesus of Nazareth was an actual person, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on a cross, and that he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But here's the key to all of this. If Jesus' story ended with the grave, I would have no rational reason to hope that there is indeed life after death. In fact, the story of Jesus, if it ended with his death, I wouldn't have much reason to put a lot of stock in Jesus' teachings at all. Because so many of his claims are hinged on the idea that he is the Son of God. And that he has power over everything, including death itself. But I do believe that Jesus did, in fact, raise from the dead. And if it's true that Jesus could raise from the dead, then I have absolute confidence that his promises of life after death for you and for me are also true. So how do I know that the story of Jesus' resurrection is true? Well, for one thing, the Bible says that it happened, and I believe that the Bible is true. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But, but for any of you out there today who are saying, well, wait a minute, the Bible is nothing more than a book of fairy tales that people have used for generations to get people to act or behave a certain way or conform to a particular way of life. So, so okay, I, I get it. Let's step back for just a minute, okay? Because even if you aren't sure whether or not the Bible is true yet. Let's set the Bible aside for just a second and look at five pieces of evidence which explain why I believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he did what the Bible says he did. I'm going to give you a, a, an easy way to remember these five pieces of evidence so that you can kind of carry these with you and chew on them as you go throughout uh, this week. I want you to know that these aren't original with me. I'm not trying to pretend to... Uh, reinvent the wheel here, but it uses, you got five fingers, and so it's going to use all five of your fingers, okay? So the first, we'll, we'll go kind of in this order here. We'll start with your, your thumb. So what I want you to do is take your thumb and point it behind you like you're uh, referring to something that's already happened, something that's back there in the past, because your thumb is going to re remind you that Jesus has affected history, the stuff that has happened before, 
if you're sitting next to somebody right now in, in your room or living room, wherever you might be, uh, ask them what the date is today. I'll go, go ahead. Seriously, ask them what the date is today. Now, if I could ask you, and if you could talk back to me, you would tell me that today is April 10th, 2020. Now, look at that same person that you just asked what the date is and ask this question. Why? I, I'm serious. Ask them, why is it that date? I mean, what, what happened to make this the year 2000? And twenty. Why isn't it the year two hundred and forty-four, or five hundred and seventy-six, or five million and eighty-nine? What was it that happened two thousand and twenty years ago that causes us to mark that as year one? That's when everything changed. It was Jesus. Maybe you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or maybe you just think he is a megalomaniacal lunatic. But regardless of what you believe about Jesus, we all measure the course of history according to two major divisions. B.C., which is short for before Christ, and A.D., which is short for Anno Domine. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, but it means it's Latin for the year of our Lord because Jesus has changed the entire course of history. Everything that we measure is happening uh, because of that division of before Christ and in the year of our Lord, whether you believe Jesus is who he ha- says he is or not. So Jesus changed the course of history. All right, so s- secondly, I want you to hold up your pointer finger and act like you're teaching somebody something very important. I hope that your teachers don't teach like this, but we'll just pretend for a second that you are teaching something important to someone else, all right, because your your pointer finger is meant to remind you that Jesus has shaped and affected the world of education. Before Jesus, the only the super wealthy, privileged families of antiquity had access to the ability to learn how to do things like read and write. That was only for somebody who was super rich or uh, super involved, super invested, super high up, socially speaking. Over the centuries, however, followers of Jesus saw the value in helping everyone be able to learn basic skills like reading and writing and comprehension. So things like schools and colleges were started by people whose lives were changed and affected by Jesus because Jesus has changed the world of education and the way that we see the value in it. Nowadays, we see basic education as a necessity, which everyone should be able to have access to, but it wasn't that way until after Jesus. Here's a fun fact for you. 92% of the world's current major universities, which were established before the Civil War, had their roots as Christian institutions. Because, Because of Jesus, we value everyone's right to education. So we've done our thumb, which reminds us of history. Uh, We've done our pointer finger, which reminds us of education. Uh, And now we're going to move very carefully onto this uh, third finger. So I'm not going to isolate that finger for obvious reasons. Uh, That'd be a fun screenshot to send to your friends and parents, right? Uh, But so instead of just using your your third finger, uh, I want you to change it, your whole hand, to uh, the letter C. All right, this third finger, well, we're making it the letter C, is to help us remember that Jesus has changed the idea of compassion. Things like medical care and doctors and even hospitals exist because followers of Jesus said, hey, wait a minute, Jesus didn't leave the sick and afflicted out in the streets to die, and so neither will we. Before Jesus, it was common practice for those who were sick to be kicked out of the house and out of the town and left to kind of fend for themselves. But followers of Jesus looked at the people who were left alone to die and they decided to practice something which Jesus modeled and preached. Hospitality. If you're listening to this in your room, um, I I want you to try something fun, okay? Just, Just for a quick second. Yell out into the hallway to your mom or dad or whoever it is that you live with and say, hey mom, if my arm were to fall off, where would you take me? Now, if you actually do that, you might have to take just a second to pause this video because somebody's going to come into your room and make sure that A, you haven't indeed lost an appendage, or B, that you haven't lost your mind. 
Uh, but once all that is over, uh, they're going to tell you what? They're going to say, well, if your arm falls off, I'm going to take you to the hospital. It is a place where people show hospitality. See, I'm not just being cheesy. That's really where we get the word uh, hospital from, is that people had practiced hospitality to the sick and the afflicted, and they built on rooms to their houses, and they called them hospitals, where they practiced and showed hospitality. Let me take this just a, a step further, okay? Think of the names of the hospitals that are closest to you where you live. The ones closest to me are, are St. Elizabeth. There was one that used to be called St. Luke. Uh, there's another one a little bit further away called Christ Hospital. Maybe you've heard uh, and live closer to one that's called Baptist Health or St. Joseph. And Have you ever heard of the hospital St. Jude? If you step back and notice a pattern here, you'll see that a lot of these places of hospitality have been deeply influenced by the Christian faith. And that's not just by coincidence. It's because Jesus changed the way that we look at compassion. So to recap, so far, Jesus has forever shaped the way that we view history and how we even measure time. He's changed the idea of education and the importance and the right for everyone to access it. He's changed the world of compassion and the way that we should reach out to others who are less fortunate and who are in need physically. And, and now for the fourth way that Jesus has changed the course of all history and time. Um, for, our, for our fourth finger here, what I want you to do, it's maybe a little bit of a stretch, but maybe it'll help you remember. It helps, helps me remember. Take your fourth finger and, and bend it down, all right, like you're holding an artist's palette, right? Those things that have all the different colors and stuff. And so I got fancy. I got a brush, uh, my own brush, whatever I just said. Anyways, that's to help you remember that Jesus has changed the world of art. One study that was done a few years ago estimated that if you were to take this giant magnet and if you were to hold it above the, the major art institutions around the globe, and if that magnet pulled away all of the sculptures and all of the paintings which were influenced or depicting of Jesus or something related to Christianity, we would lose about 75% of those major exhibits. And that is because Jesus changes everything. For a lot of us, uh, uh, one aspect of the arts that really resonates with us on a daily basis is, is music. It's just part of our, our daily lives. So when it comes to music, did you know that our very method of reading and writing music was invented by the church so that people could more easily worship God together? It's because Jesus has changed the world of the arts. Now we're on to our pinky finger, right? And, and a pinky finger is not strong enough to do anything on its own. And that's kind of helpful because for this uh, pinky finger part to help us remember, we, we've gone through all five. And so now we're at the part where we're, we're going to make a, a hand like we're reaching. It's kind of hard to do with this angle. <laughs> but we're reaching down to help someone up. The pinky finger is not strong enough on its own. It's going to help us reach down and lift someone else up. And that's, that's because our pinky finger is meant to remind us uh, that Jesus has shaped the way that we see human dignity. Now, admittedly, the church has not always done a great job at this idea of human dignity, and, and we still have a ways to go. But things like orphanages, where children who have been thrown into town trash heaps were rescued, and, and to more recent movements like abolition and the civil rights movement in the 60s, those had Jesus as their major foundation for change in the way that we see everyone as being created in the image of God. It was followers of Jesus who said that all of life has value regardless of age or gender or skin color. Before Jesus' influence on the world, people underestimated the value of human life. And we still have a ways to go on this front, like I said, but nevertheless, Jesus has shaped the way that we consider the value of life and human dignity. So just to help you remember all five, right? We've got Jesus has changed the course of history, the way that we even measure time. Uh, he has changed our idea of the value of education and everyone's right to have access to that. Uh, he has changed 
our concept of compassion, starting things like hospitals and, and reaching out to the sick instead of just leaving them to die. He's changed the world of the arts and he has also changed our idea of the value of human life and human dignity. So why do I believe that there is life after death? It's because I believe that what we're celebrating this weekend in just a couple of days is, is true. I believe that Jesus' story didn't end with the grave, that he rose from the dead. And if he is powerful enough and honest enough to make good on that promise, he's going to make good on the promise of our resurrection too. I think that we are not only swimming in the influence of a life after Jesus, I think we're drowning in it. It is everywhere we look to the point where we don't even tend to notice it a lot of times, right? I, I believe that Jesus really did raise from the dead because the world is different because of him. Because whether you believe in him or not, Jesus changes everything. And that's pretty impressive, if you ask me, especially when you consider the fact that Jesus existed thousands of years before the internet or the telephone, even the printing press, and, and he was a guy who didn't travel more than a few hundred miles away from the town that he was born in. We don't talk about or remember anything that happened more than just a couple of hundred years ago, and yet, here I am, in my basement, in a makeshift little internet studio, and there you are, watching this on your phone or in your room or maybe on your living room TV. And we are remembering Jesus because Jesus changes everything. And that's why I believe that there is life after death and we can take God at his word.